Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Steve Raymond. I'm uh, from Newcastle working at Hunter IVF. I, um, I'm one of the doctors with IVF Australia and we started Hunter IVF in Newcastle in um, about 20 years ago. And I have been doing IVF and infertility for a good number of years. So tonight I've been asked to talk about endometriosis. Uh, I do see quite a lot of patients with endometriosis and it's a very big part of my medical practice. Um, I didn't get dressed up in, in these pyjamas just uh, for the talk. I actually, I'm still at the hospital and we just finishing an operating list. So um, that's what I do for real. So to talk about endometriosis, I have prepared um, some slides to just sort of start the presentation, but I'm happy to take some questions and I have uh, received a few questions already. So um, uh, I will address those. So as I said, I am from Newcastle Hunter IVF. Um, to talk, let me just share the screen a little bit more. I'll open that up. Here we go. And uh, open the chat box so that here we are, so I can take questions. Um, talking about endometriosis, we, um, uh, let's get this one. Uh, to start off with, we can easily just have a, a case, you know, a real patient, a 33 year old who came along with uh, increasingly painful periods she's, since she stopped the pill about eight months ago to start trying to have a, a baby. And the story is that she had laparoscopy when she was about 20 and had um, moderate endometriosis, just a little bit of endometriosis she was told and it was, she was treated. What should we do for a patient like that? Um, you know, I, I guess seeing we're talking about endometriosis, we will all be thinking, yep, we should do a laparoscopy, have a look, know what's, what's happening. And sure enough, this is her laparoscopy. And we can see that there are quite a, a few deposits of endometriosis. It's, it's a video I'll just play very briefly, but we can see deposits of endometriosis. And although she didn't have a lot of symptoms, she even had endometriosis that affected the bowel. And this has to be treated very well and very accurately to provide her with good relief of her symptoms and a good chance of falling pregnant. So I'll just move on from that one. Endometriosis is really, really common. I think people are much more aware of it now. And um, there's been a, a big push from last year uh, to, to make that known throughout Australia. But just a, as a roughly one in 10 women uh, of all of reproductive age are presumed to have endometriosis. If we break it down, if we're doing absolutely elective laparoscopies for tubal ligation or sterilizations, about 10 to 15 percent of those patients will have endometriosis. Um, whether it's significant for them or not is another story. If we look at the patients who are trying to fall pregnant and who have difficulty falling or don't fall with or without symptoms, about 40% of those patients will have some degree of endometriosis. The group I really want to talk about tonight, and I've got a few take home messages. One take home message I want you to remember is think about young women, 15 to 25. We cannot ignore them and just tell them they're princesses, they've got to put up with pain. We, see, we need to be far more aware of those younger patients with endometriosis. I will talk about medical and surgical treatment and how endometriosis affects uh, fertility as well. But younger women, if we look at those in that age group, 15 to 25, who have pain and who end up having a laparoscopy, a very significant number of them, 30 to 40 percent of them, will end up having endometriosis. Uh, Again, in a bigger group right across, if we're doing laparoscopies for pain, we find that about 50% of those girls will have it. So this is another way to, to look at um, roughly one in 10 women will have severe period pain that will affect schooling, career path, et cetera. One in 10 women suffer from endometriosis and up to one in three women will have some difficulty falling pregnant and need some help. This is a part that really, really bugs me that we need to, to really think and talk about far more. Uh, the delay in diagnosis. I see so many patients that are, uh, have had symptoms when we look back for five, eight, 10 years. So there is this well-established delay and we need to make people far more aware of it and uh, have a very, very low index of suspicion. 
because there's no doubt endometriosis affects social and economic participation and it can progress to chronic pain and it's very important to address that uh, closely. A very important group and now it's becoming more and more real to me is I've been in practice long enough that I have looked after mums and they've got daughters and these daughters are in their uh, 20s and 30s and those patients who have close relatives with endometriosis, mums, sisters, grandmothers, aunties, they are up to seven to 10 times more likely to have endometriosis as well. So it's very, very important to make sure we diagnose it early. If I go back to the younger women as well, we have to keep in mind that if we can diagnose it early and treat it well early, it means that they have a better quality of life, better chances of falling pregnant naturally, less long-term disease, less long-term chronic pelvic pain, so it's, it's very, very important to screen people early. And these are the sort of things we find at laparoscopy, little blister deposits, uh, we call them like uh, powder burns, but there's a variety of appearances and it, it can be uh, over in the pouch of Douglas, over the bladder, over the, the uterus, over the ovaries, but the common place is in behind the uterus and in front of the bowel, right at the top of the vagina internally. And we do see quite a lot of various deposits of endometriosis. I guess I, I, the symptoms of so the classic textbook symptoms we talk about are uh, difficulty falling pregnant, pain with intercourse, uh, painful periods. But patients can have a whole variety of symptoms. And I see a lot of patients who have bowel symptoms as well. And the bowel symptoms can just be there the whole time, or they can be there at the time of um, periods only. So it's quite important to, to get a good history from these patients. Patients can also have bladder symptoms. Uh, they can have um, changes in sensation in the bladder, symptoms of urinary tract infection, feeling like they need to go frequently, uh, occasionally get blood in the urine, um, so there's a number of, of ways that they can present. And obviously difficulty falling pregnant is another one. So the, the symptoms can vary a lot. I think it's, it's really important if people have any symptoms to talk to a good GP who will listen and get a referral to a gynecologist who will listen to the story and decide, yes, this could be something that we need to chase up more. So, so there, is a, a, there are quite a large variety of symptoms. Um, when we talk about treatment for this condition, uh, we obviously talk about um, reducing pain, stopping progression of the disease, uh, protecting fertility. Uh, so th there are uh, a lot of good ways that we can address those, treating the pain and preventing the disease from getting worse. And protecting fertility is obviously really important, especially in the younger women, but across the age groups when women want to have babies. And there are obviously medical and surgical types of treatment. And for patients with great difficulty falling pregnant, we can then move on to IVF if that's what patients want, uh, want to move on to. Uh, I'm happy to take questions as, we, as I'm going along via the chat box. Um, uh, and I will reply to those in, in a little while or as, as we come along. So um, I'll just keep going for a, a minute there and I then we'll look at, at some questions. Um, the sort of standard medical treatment that uh, we can start with generally uh, will be analgesics. But the, the big question is, when do we do medical treatment? Do we just do it without doing a laparoscopy or should we do a laparoscopy? Um, I think for the younger patients, particularly uh, it, it's, you know, 15, 18 year olds, it's very appropriate to be looking at using the pill, but there has to be a very low threshold. So if we've got a, a 16 year old with a very strong family history and two sisters with endometriosis, I don't think we should be just starting with analgesics and, and looking at whether to use a pill. I think they need a really clear early diagnosis. Um, we've, uh, so once a, an experienced gynecologist makes a decision about whether to go to surgery or to medical treatment, um, then they can advise whether to use uh, things like uh, the pill, 
uh, that's quite a, a reasonable option and trying to minimize the number of periods that patients might have. We understand more and more that we want to minimize the amount of estrogens that patients get in trying to control the endometriosis. Uh, estrogen does tend to feed endometriosis, so we want to reduce that. And we can use progesterone-only type medications. So there's a Marina, there's Implanon, um, that's a rod in the arm. There's Vizan, which is a progesterone only. That is really very, very good uh, for, protect, for um, treatment of endometriosis. And, and there's uh, some other progestogens, progesterone type medications. So we're talking about Dunazol, Provera, those sorts of medications. Um, again, for a lot of patients, we find particularly the patients, say 15 to 30, for instance, that they really have really very active ovaries. And a lot of these medications are a single dose, one dose fits all, like the Marina is a one dose fits all, or the Implanon is a one dose fits all. So you need an experienced gynecologist that would be able to say, look, this is not enough for you. Your ovaries, I can see, are still very active despite the Marina or despite the Implanon. We need to add a second medication. I talk about these patients having little super V8 ovaries that are just overriding the medication and overriding and continuing to give symptoms and pain. And we need sometimes uh, combinations of medication. Combinations can work well as well to try and minimize side effects. So you approach it from different directions. So you don't end up just on a high dose of one medication only. I've got a, a couple of questions here about uh, miscarriages and about um, and treatment of endometriosis before IVF. I will come to that in very briefly, but they're, they're good questions. Um, so looking at, I'll just move on from medications. Generally, for most of us gynecologists, we will be looking at doing a laparoscopy to assess it and to check, does uh, that patient really have endometriosis? There are a number of causes of pain for, young, for patients, for women who have pain. Uh, generally, I'll say we need to check that uh, there's no gynae reasons. We need to check there's no bladder reasons, that there's no bowel reason, and there's no pelvic floor reason. And, and so, and very often we'll start with a laparoscopy to just clarify, is endometriosis the cause of this, or is it one of the factors, are there other factors at play? And a good laparoscopy with treatment at the time, whether it's ablation or excision, and preferably excision, uh, will provide really good relief of pain for 70 to 85% of patients, uh, also will improve fertility. But we have to accept, unfortunately, I believe endometriosis is a happens in patients because of a genetic or an autoimmune predisposition. We don't understand why some patients get it and not all patients get it. The, the, the main theory of why women get endometriosis is so-called retrograde menstruation, where patients uh, have bleeding internally at the time of their period, and that allows the tissue to implant. Well, why don't all women get endometriosis? So if we believe there's this autoimmune or genetic predisposition, it means that our surgery or our medications will treat it at a time, but those patients will continue to have that predisposition. So that's why sometimes people will say surgery doesn't fix it or hysterectomy doesn't fix it or medication doesn't fix it, but it, it's, um, it has to be managed and managed over time. Um, Lap, as I mentioned, laparoscopy is a gold standard, but good uh, ultrasound can be very, very helpful, but it will not show the early forms of endometriosis. Again, we have to go back to laparoscopy. So if I keep, maybe I'll look at some of the questions here. I've got one question from Helen and it's saying, let me just move that back to that. Many fertility specialists suggest don't do laparoscopy to see endometriosis as I don't have time with my eggs. I was 43, now 46. And if I have a surgery now, it will decline my fertility further. Minimal period pain. Well, it's a really good question for Helen because uh, it, it depends what the problem is for the patient. So if generally, as a very without sort of talking specifically and knowing the whole story, if we have a patient who presents with pain, we need to assess that patient, do a laparoscopy, treat the disease, and, and improve their symptoms and improve their lifestyle. If fertility is a main issue, 
and we have mild disease, it's certainly very appropriate to move on directly. So if we have a patient with some symptoms suggestive of endo or previous endo, but if they come for fertility and there's a, they have minimal symptoms, they've got a normal pelvic ultrasound, they have normal uh, blood tests like a low CA125, but they have a low egg reserve. And particularly if there's other, uh, maybe a low sperm count as well, which is very common, those patients are better off to move directly to IVF and have a uh, to assist in reproduction and have a better chance that way they will fall pregnant possibly quicker. But if we see the you know 23 year old who's got pain and wants to have a baby, then it's appropriate to treat her with surgery, treat her endometriosis, get her better, give her a better chance of falling pregnant naturally, and then consider assisted reproduction IVF if they, if they uh, don't fall pregnant over a period of time. Uh, next question I have here is, I have another one from Cherie. It says, can mis uh, endometriosis cause miscarriages at all? No, I miscarriages. My doctor is looking at this as a diagnosis as it may have, but it could be a reason miscarriages. Look, uh, endometriosis and a particular form of endometriosis called adenomyosis, where adeno means Glands, meiosis means muscles. Uh, adenomyosis, the old fashioned term was internal endometriosis to the uterus. That possibly can cause endometriosis. It, there's a, another, uh, so theoretically, girls or patients with endometriosis will have uh, maybe poorer or lower quality eggs. And theoretically, then maybe that will lead to more miscarriages. But certainly, endometriosis is not generally regarded as a cause of recurrent miscarriages. And you have to look at a lot of things and looking at the egg reserve and looking to make sure that the uterus is really normal and doesn't have this internal endometriosis. So that's something that your doctor would be chasing up. Um, Another question that I have here, I've got a question from Sarah saying, can endometriosis cause high estrogen levels? Uh, currently had four failed cycles, three due to extremely high estrogen levels, but are unexplained infertility. It, I might have endo, but I don't have any other symptoms. Uh, the short answer is no. Endometriosis will not cause you to have high estrogen levels. So endometriosis is just there in your pelvis. Uh, it will not alter your cyclical hormonal pattern. And if your doctor is, obviously, if you're doing IVF cycles, you're using, um, uh, if you've got high fail cycles, high estrogen levels, I don't know whether you might have polycystic ovaries. About 10 to 15% of girls with polycystic ovaries will also have endometriosis. So if the main condition is uh, polycystic ovaries, uh, and polycystic ovarian syndrome and having high estrogen levels because of lots of follicles and a little bit of endo is not the endo that's giving you the high levels. So, um, but a lot of patients with PCOS or failed IVF cycles uh, definitely need to be screened for endo. If we go back to one of the early slides that I had that 40% of patients with infertility will have some endo. So it's very possible. Um, let me just move on. A couple of other questions that I've had. Um, just one second. I've got one here. Do you believe having a repeated excision surgery causes harms, uh, causes harm and more scar tissue? Well, um, I think if you have excision surgery that is done very well and very carefully, and excision needs to be very precise. So, we, we remove only the diseased tissue and being very mindful of maintaining fertility. My mantra is let's be really aggressive to the disease, but be very conservative to fertility. So uh, the disease is the disease. Um, we're starting behind the eight ball because people have got the disease. Uh, at the end of the day, we can only work with what we have. So if patients have disease that we need to treat, uh, so if there is active disease, then it needs to be managed well with a combination, uh, a very judicious approach of, I think, 
first up, everybody deserves a really good laparoscopy and a really good attempt at clearing the disease as much as possible. Then we need to look at ways of delaying recurrence. So using medication, and there's a whole range. We've got some very powerful, strong ones, and we've got some uh, ones that are better tolerated. But at the end of the day, we have to use hormones and they have side effects. And there's always a price to pay with using medications and side effects. So if we can judiciously use a good surgery, delay recurrence of disease or achieve a pregnancy naturally or pregnancy with IVF, um, if that's what's required, then we can go back to whether we need medication again for a short period of time. And if patients have got a big cyst of endometriosis in the ovary, that needs more likely needs to be treated. And we can talk about those sorts of ones. But generally speaking, I don't, you know, the, the patients who have I don't believe that patients should be having a laparoscopy every year, every second year for treatment of their burning their endometriosis. I think it needs to be treated well. It needs to be managed well with medication to delay recurrence. And then, uh, you know, people need to have a plan. You, you can't just go to a doctor, just cut my endo out and disappear for five years. I think patients need a plan of management as to what their life's doing. Uh, when are they having their pregnancies? How do we get to that point, keeping them well and healthy? Uh, and comfortable? Uh, how do we get them to manage to have intercourse and, and not be sore? So there's just a, a variety of things. So there's a role for repeated surgery, but I think there's too much of just let's go and burn a bit more, that sort of thing. Can IVF drugs lead to a flare up? I hate to say, but yes, because we have to make you ovulate. Uh, well, it's not just IVF drugs, but uh, if you are ovulating naturally and you've had endo and this is not suppressed with medication, just your own estrogen levels and your own ovulation will can gradually flare up your endometriosis. Um, if we then go on to adding whether it's letrozole or clomiphene to make people ovulate, yes, that can make endo come. The only way to stop your endo is to stop your periods and stop your ovulation and not make any hormones. Uh, otherwise, whether it's natural cycles or whether it's uh, ovulation drugs or whether it's IVF, uh, endometriosis symptoms can, can flare up. Uh, do I believe an anti-inflammatory diet can help? I've, endometriosis is an inflammatory condition. It causes irritation significantly in the pelvis. So theoretically, I, I guess I have to say yes, but honestly, I don't know what an inflammatory diet is and I'm not the one to advise you on that. So you might need to talk to someone else. Um, another question, is endo friendly? Is there an endo-friendly protocol in IVF? Um, there's no just a specific, just an endometriosis protocol. I mean, we, we all, 40% of our patients in IVF, if not more, have endometriosis. So all I get, uh, from my perspective, I would say that all protocols are endo-friendly. So it's not like you can take someone with severe disease and just give them this endo-friendly protocol to, to make them uh, achieve a pregnancy. So re in reality, you have to treat their disease well, whether it's going to be surgery, whether you add medication, whether you just have a burst of medication for three or four months and then go to IVF. So I, I think any experienced IVF specialist will treat your endometriosis well and get you to the right point where you are well enough to be doing an IVF cycle in the best of health. Uh, one other question, can it cause ovulation pain? Absolutely. So um, the, um, of, if there is endometriosis, um, doesn't matter where it is. Endometriosis is an abnormal, uh, is normal endometrium. So the lining of the womb is growing in other places. Um, so basically, the, the little islands of tissue in the pelvis of patients with endometriosis are gradually um, every um, going through the same phase in the cycle as what the, the womb is doing. So the lining as it's growing in the womb is also growing in the pelvis. When, the, when ovulation happens and the lining has to change and progesterone is produced to uh, aim to support a pregnancy, 
um, there is uh, there are changes in those deposits of endometriosis in the pelvis and when when a woman has a period those little deposits of endometriosis bleed in the pelvis and then they have to heal up as well so if there's deposits close to the ovary or even in different places in the pelvis it's not meant to be there it will irritate the pelvis it'll irritate the bowel it will irritate the bladder yes it, it, it can cause pain uh, so um, I'm afraid that yeah, it, it can cause ovulation pain, but it's not. Um, um, oh, I better stop sharing my screen. One second, I've been. Um, okay, here we go. So I think let me just have a look at chat. There might have been a couple more questions on here that I need to look at. Yep. Okay. Uh, Premenstrual cycle symptoms, nausea, cramps, back pain, bloating, fatigue, and postmenstrual symptom. Yeah, look, uh, Bonnie, those symptoms that you described can be related to endometriosis. So some women with endometriosis will get this uh, brownish sort of loss before their period starts. Uh, they will get, uh, and the endometriosis in the pelvis will irritate the bowel and they will get bloating, they will get distension of their tummy, um, that can start causing um, bowel symptoms like some diarrhea with periods, some patients will get this really sharp jabbing, stabbing pain in the bowel or in the vagina, uh, opening their bowels during their periods. I had a patient who told me she would avoid pooing for five days during a period, so because it was just too sore to do that. Um, and often uh, one of the questions is whether uh, period pain continues after the heavy days and the worst days. For some patients, that'll be a flag that it is endometriosis. So I, I guess, you know, uh, Bonnie, I would say you need to talk to your doctor. He needs to listen to your story. Maybe, I don't know your age, I don't know if you're on the pill. Um, that would definitely be, uh, could be part of endometriosis. It, it, it's very... Uh, it, it's a very mixed bag of symptoms and we just have to have a very low threshold uh, of awareness to, to be prepared to, to go and do uh, and assess patients properly. Uh, and just don't be put off by uh, so-called normal ultrasounds because uh, a lot of endometriosis will not be seen, although now there are some uh, good specialist ultrasound units, uh, particularly run by gynecologists, who are very, very good at targeting um, a specific uh, doing uh, ultrasound examination in a very specific way, looking at the movement of the, the bowel, looking at the bowel wall thickness, looking at the wall of the ovary, uh, looking at to whether there's good mobility of the ovary or not. So, so there are a, a good number of, uh, of good units that will do a very good ultrasound and give you um, a, some good, a, a good explanation as to what may be happening. But uh, a negative ultrasound doesn't say it's not there. Uh, and, but a, a positive ultrasound can be very, very helpful when we're planning surgery, particularly for patients who've got severe endometriosis, whether it's in the wall of a bowel, in the wall of a bladder, it's blocking the ureter or doing a variety of things. Uh, I can see there's another question about diet here. Um, look, I'm no expert on diet. I, would, I have... Uh, several um, dietitians that I send patients to who will encourage them about uh, their diet. So I, I'm not one to advise you about diet. I'm very sorry. Um, I just wonder if there are any questions here. We're getting to 7.30 and I've done a lot of uh, talking. Um, I think we'll probably bring it to a close. I'd like to thank all of you. I believe they've been, I've been told there's something like 39 people watching. So I hope it has been helpful. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have questions, um, you are very welcome. There's a 1-800 number on the IVFA website that you can go to. Uh, you can also look at the IVF um, Australia website. And of course, there's a Hunter IVF website in Newcastle. Um, by all means, come and visit us up here. And uh, you, you can also be obviously referred to one of the IVFA uh, a gynecologist or specialist who, who will look after all patients with endometriosis. So thank you very much for joining us and, and I hope that's been helpful and you have a good night. Bye.